What's going to be happening in those breakout sessions? You're about to find out. Would you give Mike Clarence a great welcome to West Florida this morning as he comes to tell you what his session will be about. Good morning. So good to see you. I had, my wife and I had a chance to be in the district uh, with you just a few months ago for a minister's marriage retreat. Got to meet several new friends, and it's great to see familiar faces and new ones as well. It's good to be here. Slowly we're arriving at that conclusion. It's good to be here. No, I know you're excited to be here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of this day. Uh, Ron and I are prepared today. What we're here to do is to help in any way we can, to encourage you, uh, to offer you maybe some insights that we've been able to gain by being involved with lots of churches all over the country. And uh, just very excited to share with you today. I, I'm looking forward to what Ron's going to share in, in this general session. I, I love Ron McManus. I appreciate him greatly. Um, uh, I told him some time ago that when I grow up, <laughs> if I grow up, I want to be Ron McManus. That's, that was, I don't want to be like him. I want to be Ron McManus. No, I just uh, appreciate him so very, very much and I uh, look forward to what he's going to share with you today. Um, my wife and I came to back to the national office in Springfield, as Pastor Tommy said. Uh, we did that about a year and a half ago after pastoring for 10 years in Wichita, Kansas, and, and uh, just having a wonderful time there. And, and God has shown us some stuff that we believe can, we can help churches. And so today, what I'm going to be focusing on in the two workshop sessions over in the Activity Center, the first session, we're going to talk about two steps for the smaller congregation. The reality is that Two-thirds of our churches in the Assemblies of God are, would be considered smaller by number. And sometimes when you're pastoring in those settings, I've been there, I know you can feel like there's so much I can't do. You know, I, I go to maybe a big event and I hear a large church pastor speak. And, and I'm excited about what God's done in their life. And I sit there and think, I can't do that. I, I don't have the resources. I don't have the people. I, I don't have what... And you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever felt that at times? And so... We worked on some things we want to share that are very confident that each of us can do that can lead us to a healthy church. And a healthy church is one that's freed up to grow as God gives the increase. And so, so excited to share that with you. And then in the, in the afternoon session, I'm going to talk to you about hospitality in the church and, and some new basics of hospitality. The world around us has changed. What people are looking for, if they drift into our churches, is much different than what it once was. And, and business as usual is not necessarily connecting with our culture. And so I want to talk to you about some insights, some things relative to how that has changed. Because how many want to connect with unchurched people? I want to see Jesus reach people that have never heard his name? There are actually folks who didn't know they weren't in church yesterday morning. It just never occurred to them. They're not even thinking that way. And so we're going to talk about that in the, in the uh, second session. Then I'll get to share with you this afternoon in the final general session. I really just want to uh, share something that's deep on my heart concerning the health of the church. And so looking forward to that. But I want to get out of the way and, and let Brother Ron come and, and guide you this morning in a very important session. So Pastor Tommy, you want to come and yeah. really do that. Thank you so very much. Would you give Mike Clarence all a great hand? How many of you were with us at Pine Valley and got to, I mean, was it awesome or what? <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, there, there's no way to sum it up. It, it's not a home run. It's a knockout of the park when Mike and Carrie uh, deliver their, their heart, and you're going to enjoy their ministry today. Uh, Mike will be doing the last general session when we come back together as well. So you're going to get exposed to all this today. And if you can't make one of the sessions, they will be video and audio recorded and also eventually be available on the website. So, you know, that's the way we can do to cram it all into one day, okay? Again, uh, another man of God, as I mentioned last night, that has poured into our life, into this district for many years. But you know, he said last night, he was saying some things that he had said before. He could say them to me every day. I think I need to hear it. My heart was broken recently as I sat with a pastor, my wife and I, and uh, I had been in his church. And the observation was that 80% of the people in that church had very gray hair. And they weren't prematurely gray, pre prematurely gray either. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being a senior adult, amen? <laughs> That's wonderful. We need them. Our heritage is awesome. That's great. we got to have them. They have to be ministered to. It's, it's, it's powerful. But when 80% of the people sitting out there in your congregation are 70 years old or older, the future of that church is scary. And I thought, boy, what we're going to offer at council is going to help this pastor so much. And I sat down with him at the table and I said, I'm just looking forward to seeing you at council in a few days. 
whenever it was going to be. And he said, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. I've been busy doing a lot of stuff around here, and I just don't know if I'm going to have time to get up there or not. And my heart broke because I said, man, you need what we're going to hear. We need, and you need it as a pastor. You're in trouble, guy, and you don't even know it. You're in trouble, and you don't even know it. What you're about to receive this morning and what you received last night, what you're going to receive the rest of this day, can revolutionize and transform your life if we'll come down and humble ourselves and say, God, I could use some instruction. I could use some help. I don't know it all. And I am not going to stay here. <laughs> and I'm not going to start either. Because <laughs> that same spirit's in this house this morning that was here last night. If you wasn't here last night, you don't know why that's so moving. But we're not going to stay here. So we need some help to move. Would you welcome Ron McManus back this morning? Amen. Well, good morning. Wow. Great to see each of you today. And uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us come on, be glad. You know, um, uh, a year or two ago, they did this uh, whole edition of Enrichment Magazine on depression in the ministry. I read it and wanted to go do that, just that. So I suggested, you know, maybe we need a whole edition on the joy of ministry. I've been depressed long enough. How about you? The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so many of us have lost our strength because the devil's robbed us of our joy. The joy suckers are everywhere. You see, that's, that's why I, uh, some of you are, are more braver than I am. Before church on Sunday morning, I never was out roaming around with the folks. I'm hiding out in the back room. You know why? Because I don't want a joy sucker to get to me before I get a chance to preach. Just sure as a word, one of them joy suckers will walk up to you and just <laughs> suck the joy right out of your life. Then you got to go preach. No way, Jose. I'm, on, I'm hiding out in the back room. After service, open season on me. You can come talk to me. I'm here. I'm at the altar. I'm everywhere. But before I preach, don't mess with me. Hallelujah. Two or three things we're just asking the Lord to help us with in the Assemblies of God in these days. And it's a, it's a cultural shift from where we've been. One of those has to do with a culture of continuous improvement. Unfortunately, in this fellowship, many thought that once they got their credentials, they learned all they needed to know. You just start. See, the problem in the assemblies of God is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you get that by this afternoon. <laughs> all of us have to keep learning and growing. I don't know it all. I, I learn stuff every week about church. I've been in this 42 years so far. It's like a superintendent friend, I said, he, he, uh, he, uh, Mike can use this in your marriage thing. He said, he's been married 42 years. He said, the first 42 years are the hardest. <laughs> A culture of continuous improvement. What changed my life was when I discovered that my church couldn't grow past me. Church can't grow past its pastor. Now, accidentally, some have, but the pastor's always been able to get it back where he could handle it. <laughs> if I gave you 200 people and you can only lead 100, I'll give you enough time you get it down to 100. <laughs> I promise you this. My church was running 200. I was working night and day, but it wasn't going anywhere. And I discovered that I was the one holding it back. Because I had this preconceived idea about life and church and about how you did ministry. 
And when I understood that my church could not grow past me, it sent me, set me on a journey and a passion to learn. Amen. I want to be better. Amen. I want to be better. You see, one of the things that concerns me personally is one day when I stand in the presence of the Lord, he'll say to me, Ron, there's so much more I'd like to have done with you if you only let me. I don't want to limit what God can do in my life. How about you? I want to reach my God-given potential. So a culture of continuous improvement says I've never, I've not arrived. I'm on the way, and I keep learning every week about how to do life and ministry and church. Pastors and churches with Mike and I and, and uh, Rick uh, Allen who works with us, we're working with, with probably several hundred churches right now across this country. And with their pastor and their core team of leaders that are, that are working with us in a year-long journey. And about midway through the year, pastors will walk up to me and say, you know what, Ron? I thought my people needed to change. I discovered I needed to change more than they did. That's what excites me about this moment because this day, if God can drop something into your spirit, into your life that will change your effectiveness as a pastor and as a leader, it's been worth the trip to you. I mean, the one good idea could change your life. So a culture of continuous improvement is what we've got to, we've got to have in the Assembly of God. We've got to get the lid off of our pastors and our churches. The second culture we've got to keep working on is a culture of interdependence. Because the Assemblies of God has a Lone Ranger mentality. You know, if I learned something, I wouldn't want to share it with the guy across town because his church might grow too. We wouldn't want that to happen. <laughs> Come on. What would happen if we actually committed to help each other succeed? What would happen if we actually cared enough about each other to see, you know, we're not done to every church in West Florida is healthy and effective and growing. What, what can we do? How can we do that? A culture of interdependence. We've got to stop competing with each other and start helping each other. Other than that, I don't have any thoughts about it. <laughs> Those two things, culture of continuous improvement, culture of interdependence. If we, can do, we, if we could implement those two things in our, in our culture, in the Assemblies of God, we could change this to fellowship. Wow. Change this fellowship. I told you last night the pastors called me on the phone and say, Ron, I'm, I'm at this point in our church's life and I don't know what to do. Uh, we, we're, we're not growing. We're not moving forward. We're sort of plateaued here. What should I do? And I said, the first question I asked that pastor is tell me how you spend your time. Because how you spend your time determines your destiny. The secret to your success is in your daily routine. Out of this session today, if nothing changes in your schedule next week, the chances of you, you learning anything from this session is slim to none. It's just another notebook that goes on a shelf somewhere of another district council. I'm asking you to walk away today with, with at least one thing that you can put into your life and into your schedule that will change who you are. I believe it's possible. At the beginning of the notes that you have, and that's about midway, midway through your hymnal there. <laughs> Pages are not numbered, but it's called Priorities and Decision Making. About midway through the notes. There's a quick little test I want you to take. That uh, little self-analysis test. Uh, looks like we got folks that don't have notes. Uh, Everybody got notes? No, he's got notes. Then you might register. <laughs> All right, they've got notes coming. As we continue to teach, the notes are being displayed. All right, no problem.
Hall. All right, about midway through there, uh, take about two minutes, if you will, and uh, look at the, the little test there and, and answer yes or no, okay, to, the, to what you see there, okay? Go right ahead and fill that out while they're continuing to distribute notes. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, guys. I still need notes, just right, raise your hand. Yes, I see that hand. Is there another? <laughs> Go ahead and quickly circle the yeses or noes under those statements. And I would encourage, I would, I'd like everybody to have a set of notes. I mean, spouses, uh, everybody, you know. And Pastor, don't tell, don't tell me your wife is taking notes for you. You take your own notes. in decision making midway through the last set of pages priorities and decision making all right fair praying about it. Here's the deal. If you answered yes to 10 to 12 questions above, then you handle your time extremely well. If uh, you have yes to seven to nine questions, you're good, but you still need to grow. If you said yes to six or below, you're wasting valuable time and may not even know it. How many uh, you had answered yes to 10 to 12 questions? All right, those of you who raise your hand, I want you to come teach this lesson. <laughs> you got it together. Anyway. Most of us can continue to learn, and I, even those who raise their hands, I know they do too. Let's talk about this. First of all, it, there in your notes, what was the priority of Jesus in his earthly ministry? What was the thing that Jesus did if, if you were told you have three and a half years to preach the gospel, that your ministry can only be three and a half years, how would you spend that three and a half years? Now, here would be my natural response. Get me on television and radio. I want to be able to preach the gospel to as many people as possible. I want to be able to, to extend uh, my time. I want everybody to, to, to know uh, and hear my message. Jesus had three and a half years. What was his priority? Well, disciples, he spent, he spent a great deal of time with 12 guys. And you want to say, Jesus, what are you doing? Spends all this time with these 12 guys. You need to be preaching the gospel to the multitudes. What's the second thing was a priority for him? Prayer. Prayer. 
Time with the Father. Time with the Father. He spent time with the, with the Father. He spent time training and developing 12 guys. He did speak to the multitudes. But you read through the Gospels and you find him trying to get away from the crowds a lot. Peter, get the boat ready. Let's get out of here. You know. It's all right there. And Jesus had 12 guys. He, uh, he spent more time with three of the guys than he did the rest, right? Peter, James, and John. Can you imagine Jesus saying to the other disciples, Hey guys, Peter, James, and John and I are going to go off for the weekend. You guys stay here, stay out of trouble while we're gone. Can you, say, can you hear old, uh, Matt saying, doesn't that tick you off when those three go off with Jesus? <laughs> I can hear Matt saying to Thomas, Thomas, did I ever ask you to go with him? No, doubt they ever will. <laughs> <laughs> spent more, so Jesus spent more time with three than he did the rest, right? Jesus spent even more time with one. Correct? John. I hear pastors tell me, well, you should have spent equal time with everybody. Really? Where'd you hear that from? You, you know what? You don't spend equal time with everybody. You know who gets all your time? All the needy people in your church. All the people that need counseling. The same ones that need, have needed counseling every week for the last 10 years. That's and you right. are becoming an enabler and not a pastor. Let me help you with your counseling ministry. Never counsel anybody without giving them an assignment. Right. People would walk out of my office and i say, all right, now I want you to read this paperback before we meet again. Or I want you to listen to the CD before we meet again. They may call me three or four days. Oh, pastor, it's all blown up. So if you listen to that CD, no, no, no. As soon as you listen to that CD, call me back. See, I know until they get involved in the healing process, nothing changes. <laughs> Secondly, a pastor is, a, is not a professional counselor. He is a crisis counselor only. If you can't help people in two or three meetings, you need to refer them to somebody else. Thirdly, the people I spent the most time with left my church. <laughs> Why would you keep doing this? You know who you're spending no time with? The three that you ought to be training, equipping, and developing to become leaders in your church. They get none of your time. You see, because you're too busy running an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff instead of building a fence at the top of the cliff. How you spend your time matters. Jesus said his priority was, was spending time with the Father, training 12 guys, and ministry to the multitudes. In that order. Time with the Father, training 12 guys, time with the, with the, with the people. All of those things matter to us. So, one of the principles that you hear a lot about is the 80-20 principle, the Pareto principle. Uh, there are whole books that have been written just about this principle alone. It says if you'll spend 20% of your time doing the right things, it'll produce 80% of your results. If I can get pastors to spend 20% of their time doing the most important things in their church and, and life, then they were going to see results that they've never seen before. But what we, we tend to do is spend most of our time with the folks who are the most needy in our church, and they're not going to help us do anything. Have you noticed? So the Pareto Principle kind of, kind of works out. What I prioritized determines my results. So here's the lessons learned from the 80-20 Principle. Number one is activity does not equal accomplishment. Activity does not equal accomplishment. You know, I know a lot of busy churches that are dying. Because the schedule at your church is busy does not mean you're effective. 
I know, I mean, there, there are some pastors in this district, they're too, they, they pastor 50 people, they're too busy to come to this meeting. And I can promise you, if they've been, if they've been, if they've been there for 10 years or longer and the, and the church hasn't grown, they're busy doing the wrong things. They're busy doing the wrong things. So busyness, activity does not equal accomplishment. I knew our church was in trouble when on, in January we had all of our leaders meeting together and we rolled out the calendar for the year for all of the leadership of our church. And one of my most dedicated leaders, a lay leader, she's a gal in our church, just sold out to Jesus. I mean, she was... She was the kind of person you can count on for anything, everything. I rolled out the calendar for our church, and this gal, she raises her hand. I said, yes. She said, Pastor, when I see this calendar, I get tired. I knew we were in trouble. We were busy doing a lot of things, but we were not doing the right things. Activity does not equal accomplishment. Let me just tell you, you can get plaques here at District Council and still not be effective. That's right. When I went to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, church uh, there, uh, they'd just been to a church split. They couldn't pay their bills. They had a loan floating down at the, now it was Wachovia, now it's Wells Fargo. Uh, at 22 percent. Thank you very much, Jimmy Carter. Uh, <laughs> loan floating at 22 percent. Couldn't make the payments. Had just built the first phase building on a new new piece of property, and you know, uh, not a shrub, not paid parking space. I mean, they were just in existence, just barely making it. And they brought me in which was even more trouble. But, you know, I, I was there a couple of weeks and grass was growing up around the church and I called up one of the deacons. I said, you know, somebody needs to get out of here and cut this grass. He said, our former pastor always cut the grass. I said, well, I called him. He doesn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> So you know what? I called a guy in the church, said, you know, how about meeting me down at the church and you and I cut the grass? He said, sure, Pastor, I'll help you. Next week, I called him back on the phone. I said, yeah, grass is growing at the church again. He said, what time do you want to meet? So me and the guy in our church, we cut the grass. Third week, I called him back on the phone. I said, time to cut the grass. He said, Pastor, you got better things to do. I can take care of that grass. Amen. Now, how many know if I had been cutting that grass by myself, I'd still be cutting that grass? <laughs> Never do anything alone. Never do ministry alone. Let me give it to you in the Greek. Don't do ministry by yourself. <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't even want to go to Walmart by myself. It's pretty scary over there these days. You want to wear blinders. <laughs> if you think it's think it's bad among the locals, just go down there to the beach at the Walmart where all the folks from somewhere else are. <laughs> Jesus. You know, apparently these people have no mirrors in their homes. <laughs> and so, I started on a journey 
of transferring ownership of that church from me to them. Activity does not equal accomplishment. Secondly, we got to start working smarter, not harder. There's never been a lazy bone in my body. But I had to come to understand that how I spent my time was extremely important. Because what I was doing was reacting to life instead of acting on life. I was letting everybody else in the church decide my priorities. You know, it's like that cartoon that showed up in a leadership magazine a while back. It was, it was a takeoff on the old days of the four spiritual laws. And, and the, the pastor sitting at his desk looking at his calendar and his wife was looking over his shoulder. And the caption says, God loves you and everyone else has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> That's where some of us live. We get up on Monday morning and we just react to whatever's going to happen that day. And the result is... We don't see things accomplished that we should see. I don't mean this wrong when I say this. I can accomplish more today pastoring a church in 20 hours a week than I used to in 60 hours a week. You know why? I know what I have to do now. It took me years to figure out what I'm supposed to do. It took me years to figure out what I'm supposed to do. I know you're smarter than me. You probably got it just much quicker than I did, but it took me years to figure this out. But in 20 hours a week, because I know what I have to do as a pastor to see my church move forward, and I've done six interim pastors in the last 10 years, where I had to fly in and lead a congregation, fly back out to do other things like I do now. And, and so the time element and what I spent my time doing and the, and the hours I had at that church to keep that church moving forward, the stuff I've had to learn over all these years. We gotta work smarter, not harder. Thirdly, we either organize or we agonize. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna see your church reach its God-given potential, you have gotta move from a mom and pop kind of mentality. You can't keep running a mom and pop store where you do it all and people pass judgment on how well you did it. It's not biblical. It's not biblical. See, the model, the model we inherited in our churches was not a first century New Testament model. The model we inherited was a fourth century model. You see, that infant church changed the world. From the day of Pentecost, they faced a hostile Roman government and religious persecution. That's why I said last night, no matter who's in the White House or the State House, Jesus will still build his church. Because that infant church faced a hostile Roman government and religious persecution. I mean, no religious people are kidding me. Self-righteous people. By the time we got to the 4th century, that infant church had changed the world. The Roman world was totally transformed by this Pentecostal church. Constantine came to power in the 4th century, and he did the worst thing he could have done for the church. He declared the world Christian. So instead of being the church, we started going to church. And still, instead of everybody ministering, we started hiring people to minister for us. Instead of having ghost structures at our church, we started having come structures. Has anybody noticed that y'all come ain't working? <laughs> By the way, while I'm there, let me just go ahead and mess with somebody. And we do a, this analysis with churches all the time. Did you know the average Son of God church thinks that worship is going to be the key to their success? That's what they think. All, all the analysis tell us that. Because they weight themselves high on worship and low on evangelism. See, the average person in Mariana who's never darkened the door of a church in their life 
I'm not going to come down to hear your worship. I just finished an interim pastor in Wichita, Kansas. Not, that's not where Mike pastored. It was another, another church. And uh, one of the one of the, the, uh, sh the guys who was on the short list as a candidate for the church, and they got a wonderful pastor now, and they're doing well. He called me on the phone one day. He said, "Ron, I'm like, I'm on the short list. I'm in the, the last three, and, and you know the board's considering me." And and he said, uh, "I." Uh, I just, you know, I was just thinking the other day, boy, if I, if I got a chance to lead that church, he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go all over Wichita, Kansas, and I'm going to find the church that has the greatest worship in town, and I'm going to make sure our worship is far better than anybody else's in town. That's what we're going to do. And I said, it doesn't matter. He said, what? I said, it doesn't matter. If you're interested in reaching the lost, if you're interested in reaching Christians from other churches, then your worship is important. You know, see, see it's, it's like that church, uh, uh, when I was riding down the freeway in Atlanta a while back and, and listening, to, I came on, an advertisement for a church came on the, uh, on the radio station as I'm driving through Atlanta, and here's what it said. Come to our church where we have authentic Australian worship. <laughs> now, can you hear the, see, the average guy and his wife driving down the freeway in Atlanta, never been in a church in their life, and say, oh, honey, I bet, we, 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 I bet they have kangaroos there, too. <laughs> What is he going to think? Who was that ad for? It wasn't for unchurched people. It was to try to get other church people to come to my church. See, we're so worried about somebody stealing our sheep that, that we get sidetracked from, from our main responsibility, and that's reaching the lost. You see, lost people are not evaluating your worship. You know what's going to reach them? Somebody who cares about their kids. Somebody who's got to, something to say from that pulpit when they get there. At the recent meeting uh, at the Gateway Church in Dallas, uh, Robert Morris, one of the great communicators of our day, great, great ch church, independent uh, Pentecostal church. Ed Young Jr. was speaking at his church in this conference. Ed Young said, somebody could get up in this church this Sunday and beat a trash can for 15 minutes, and then this man get up and preach and people would still come. Because they come to hear the message. Come to hear the message. Organizing our life, organizing our ministry for effectiveness. There used to be a day when you could get by with a half-baked Saturday night special. Can't no more. You know why the crowds sitting in your seat, seats today at your church are smarter than they've ever been before? Technology's messed you up. Because they heard five preachers before they got to you Sunday morning. And they know when it's good. And so preparation is important. Organizing your time, organizing your life, getting systems put in place. Fourthly, you either evaluate or you stagnate. We've talked about the fact that the church has been changing every 40 years and the world's changing every two to three years. We have to be willing to evaluate what we are doing as a church to say what's working and what isn't. One of the problems we have is that we have, we have made the method we use as sacred as the message we preach. Come on now. When you start talking about changing stuff at the church and people get stammering lips on you, <laughs> you know they've made how we do it as spiritual as the Word of God. Yeah. See, we got to get those things separated. The message remains the same. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. You will never hear from this man that we should water it down in any way, shape, or form. The truth still sets people free. Amen. The message cannot change. Right. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It, it's the same. But the package we put it in has to keep changing. But we've made the package sacred. And so the Holy Spirit can't do anything new and fresh 
He can't pour new wine in our wineskins because we'll blow up because we got so brittle and so locked into our own ways of doing things. And what the Holy Spirit wants to do is help us get our stretch back. So we can respond what the Holy Spirit's saying. How many know God doesn't need to do the same thing the same way twice? See, one of the mistakes many churches around the country made with the revival that happened down the road was they thought you can franchise revival. You can't franchise revival. Like you can box up the Holy Spirit and take him to different locations. You see, the Lord wants us to understand he wants to do his thing in his way at your place. And he wants to do something new and fresh. The Holy Spirit is the creative agent of the Trinity. He doesn't have to do the same thing the same way twice. He can do something different at your place than he does anywhere else. But we've got to be flexible and pliable and responsive so that the Holy Spirit can pour new wine into our wine skin and we're able to respond to what the Spirit's saying to do right now. Amen. And you're stretched back. Hallelujah. we got to evaluate. My daddy was a pioneer Assembly of God pastor all along this Gulf Coast. And he didn't have the benefit of all the, the education and things that I had because I'm educated way beyond my intelligence. <laughs> and I have friends in the room, yes. But my daddy had you know, just, just common sense. And this is what my daddy taught me. He said, son, if the horse is dead, for God's sake, dismount. <laughs> my suspicion is we've been riding a lot of dead horses for too long. They don't deserve our time and attention. Because if it's not bearing fruit, it doesn't belong on your schedule. Number five, you've got to schedule your priorities. You've got to schedule your priorities. This fishbowl, I want to represent your week, how you spend your week as a pastor. Now, I want us to decide what are the most important things that need to go in your week if you're going to succeed in pastoral ministries. Okay? So I want you to talk to me. What, what would be something that you believe is critical, critically important, that has to go in this week if you're going to succeed? All right. All right. So time with the Lord. Prayer. Personal devotion. Can we agree? That's a big one. All right, let's put it in. What else? All right. So another big rock would be family. Being a mom, a husband, a father, but all those responsibilities that, that, are, that are, are priorities. So family time. Are we in agreement? All right. What else? Study. Preparation to minister. Time spent in preparation to minister. Since we can't, so since we can't do uh, simple sermons for simple preachers anymore, because our crowd got too smart for us, we got to spend time studying. Are we in agreement? Yes. What else? Action. <laughs> you know, some people need repetition. I mean, just need to... <laughs> what, what, what else? Developing leaders. Developing leaders? I mean, think that might be important? So that means, that means I might spend time in a week Meeting with leaders, meeting with potential leaders, expanding the leadership base of my church. 
You know, I talk to pastors all the time, and they say, well, Ron, I don't have any leaders in my church. I said, when do you think you're going to get some? Is going to drop through the ceiling one Sunday morning? Are the Baptists going to train them and send them to you? <laughs> you see, you get leaders when you stop running long enough to start training, mentoring, and investing. And by the way, if the only time you spend with your church board is in a meeting monthly, you don't get this. It's the meetings outside of the meetings that make the meetings. I passed in my church for two years through Leonard and Henry. Leonard was vice chairman of the board, Henry was the treasurer. And Henry thought all the money belonged to him. That's the way treasurers are. Leonard liked to play golf, so I played golf with Leonard. And we talked about the church. Leonard had been there when the church was 35. Now the church is about 250. Leonard's still vice chairman of the board. Henry liked to eat. He believed Paul's admonition, you should buffet your body every day. And, and, and so, so I ate with Henry. And we talked about the church. So we'd get to board meetings and Leonard would say, you know, Pastor, I got an idea I'd like to share tonight. I'd say, fine, Leonard. Leonard would share his idea, and Henry would second it. And the rest of the board say, sounds good. Well, where do you think Leonard got that idea? <laughs> see, you see, what, 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 if you don't care who gets the credit, there's no telling what you can get done for God. See, I, I passed in my church to Leonard and Henry for two, two to three years. Until the day came, it didn't matter because we were, became a team. I didn't have to power up on anybody. I spent enough time with Leonard and Henry that, that we became brothers. Did you know Leonard was still vice chairman of my church board when our church was 3,000 in attendance? You know why? Because I taught Leonard, Leonard, if we're going to see this church reach its potential for God, you, you are old-time Pentecostal. You were born and raised in this. And you dreamed of being a part of something like this, where God's doing incredible things. He said, Pastor, you are right. Whatever I need to do to, to stay relevant and to keep learning and growing with you, I'm going to do that. And 17 years later, Leonard's still vice chairman of the board of our church. At 78, alive and well. And if I could run Leonard up here today to you and put him in front of you this morning and say, Leonard, tell these folks about our church. First of all, he'd just start weeping. And he'd say, I had no idea what God could do. If we were just, if we were just obedient and just be pliable. See, the investment of training leaders. See, what... what I have a lot of empathy for, for church board members and for others. You know why? Because we never taught them how to be spiritual leaders. And the reason some of them behave the way they do is because they've never been taught how, how to behave right. And the only thing they've got to, got is the world system to draw from. And so you spend time with these, with these people you can't lose. And by the way, spend more time with your enemies. I read that somewhere. It's like putting coals of fire on their head. See, we have a tendency to want to put space between us and whoever's against us. No, not me. I crowded them. They had to shake my hand on Sunday. No way. I was not going to behave like they did. And people started noticing, you know how our pastor's treating that person? And look what they're saying about him in the hallway. Something wrong with this picture. See, what they want to do is get you to start behaving like them. When they get you to behave like they do, they got you. You may not leave the church today, but you're gone. It's over. If I say over, it's, it's over. Because when you refuse to behave like those kind of people behave, 
And you, you, you take the high road. You can't lose. Can't lose. Never. So you crowd those folks. I've loved people right out the back door. <laughs> Serious. I loved them right out the back door. And I, I've had many of them, two or three years later, sitting back in my office, saying, Pastor, could we come back home? Would you let us come back home? We're so sorry that we were misled. You know why they could come back home? Because I loved them out the back door. And so that investment, it's a big rock. Can we put it in? Yeah. Going to it. What else? That, that, that what we're saying is if we do these things, we're going to be successful as a pastor. What else? Planning. 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 What's that? Planning. All right. Uh, and let's, let's make that a bigger thing. Administrative functions. All the administrative functions of the church we got to do, right? Right. <laughs> Just checking. Somebody's been administrative for this. What else? Got to cast vision. That's probably part of that leadership component, but because uh, let's go over what we've got in here now. We got we got uh, t time time with the Lord. We've got family. We've got pre preparation, and then we've got to put the planning part in that. Okay, all that all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've got uh, training leadership. Uh, anything else? Administration, we got in there. What else? Minister. All right. We, we got to do pastoral care. Yeah. Well, that's your personal time. That's your personal time. Uh, so we got we have to we have to to uh, we have to do weddings and funerals and and uh, oh, go to church. <laughs> Yeah, I shouldn't be assuming anything here, I guess. I, I, I just, <laughs> attend church on a regular basis. Yes. <laughs> so, 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 so there, there, there is pastoral care, there's counseling, there's uh, you know, weddings, and few, all that stuff goes in the week, right? All right, so, so what we've got is, a, is several big rocks. Now, here's what I know happens. What happens is all kind of other things take place every week. There's all of the pebbles. There's all the pebbles that the things that, that are emergencies, the, the things you didn't count on, and the things you didn't plan on, and, and all those other distractions that come to every pastor. And what happens is, before you know it, this week gets full, full, full. That's why you need to put in rest. Well, rest has got to be part of your personal time. I, I mean, I can't, I'm not going to make a big rock sleeper. <laughs> These are the things you got to do to effectively pastor your church. Personal time and family time, I'm expecting you to, to take care of all those pieces with that. That's a big rock. Now, help me with that bag, Mike. Here's what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, see, what happens is that everything starts getting messy if you're not careful. <laughs> Everything starts getting messy. See, Mike wants to pick up those pebbles because that's one of his ministries. <laughs> and he has friends in the room. 
So you, there's some of you right now want to run up here and clean up right now. You just that's what you want to do. You want to just run up here and clean up. Because this is bothering you already, see? I'm always cleaning up Well, it gives him a job to do. What can I tell you? So, so here's what happens is that I could have some help here. That would be nice. Getting really messy now. That's part of the training process, that's right? Ministry's messy. So what happens is, uh, is that most pastors let the pebbles get in there first. And the result is Can't get the big rocks in. Get, get, somebody take a picture of that. Get that visual in your head. This is the story of 90% of the pastors I know. And the result is a whole week goes by, and two weeks goes by. And a month goes by, and I'll tell you the, I'll tell you the thing that gets, gets lost quickly, and that's the investment and training of leaders. And your church can't go anywhere. Because, because you're, you're doing things to maintain a ministry instead of growing a ministry. You see, here's what got my attention. When I'm full time as a pastor, and I got a pastor down the road whose church is growing, and he has the same amount of hours in a week I do. And I'm saying to myself, what's he doing different than me? It's how he spends his time. This is what makes the difference. Is anybody getting this? We lose the opportunity to do the right things. Not we, don't, not we don't want to. We just don't get there. I get, make sure you get the pebbles down here because you know, Mike Clarence all made a mess here. <laughs> Number six, reacting is not leading. I'm running out of time. Let's go quickly now. Reacting is not leading, and that's what many pastors do. We react to what happens during the week instead of acting on what happens. Number seven, say no to little things that rob you of your time. Say no to little things that rob you of your time. Say no to the idea, not to the person. You know, I'd love to have, to have coffee with you, but, but I, this is, the, the, these are things that I have to get done. What would be wonderful is for the folks at your church to realize that you actually do have things to do. Yeah. <laughs> the average person in your church cannot figure out what you do all week. I promise you this. And, and, he, and, and, and some of you may get upset when I tell you this, but this is what I believe with all my heart. You need to get some structure into your life. You need to have office hours. You say, well, I got 30 people. Get office hours. Your people need to know you go to work. And if they call you 11 o'clock at the house and get you on the phone at, their, at your house at 11 o'clock in the morning, what it says to them, he's got nothing to do. That's what it screams at them. So why isn't he over here going to Tallahassee to visit my fourth cousin who's in the hospital? Because he's got nothing else to do. clean out a Sunday school room and create some office hours and go to work. Get some structure into your life. I know some of you are not liking this. I am telling you, if you mix all this together, if 
I get up in the morning at 10 o'clock and I run to Walmart with my wife and then I run to make a hospital call over here and then I run, do this little thing over here and I pick up the kids at school and then I do this and I do that. If you, you start mixing all that together, nobody's getting a fair shake. But if I know what I'm going to do on Mondays, because I've structured my time, if I know what Tuesdays looks like at my in my life, I know what Wednesday looks like in my life. See, I can I can rehearse for you an entire weekly schedule right now for me as a pastor. I knew I know what I did. I know what Monday was. Let me just give you a quick run through. Monday, do do not do any counseling unless you have to on Monday. Monday, you're emotionally tired. It's not a day to make decisions. Make no decisions on Monday. Monday should be a light administrative day for you as a pastor. I don't make any tough calls on Monday. I, I make sure all the stuff from Sunday gets going for the week. Now, some pastors take Monday off. I could never take Monday off because I'm not wired that way. If I took Monday off, I'd be sitting home stewing about stuff that I know to get, needs to get done. So I couldn't enjoy my day off and my wife would be miserable watching me stew about it. So I went to the office, I went to the church on Mondays. Tuesdays, I did. I met with staff. Tuesday afternoon, I took appointments with people. Wednesday, all day, I was in isolation in prayer and study. I was only available for emergencies on Wednesdays. It's a full day of prayer and study. Thursday morning till noon, I was still in prayer and study. Just come out for, for calls and emergencies. One full day and a half in prayer and study. Thursday afternoon, I took appointments with people. I always had lunch one, one day a week. I always had lunch with somebody who was unsaved. Because one of my issues is I think pastors spend all their time with Christians. That's why they're miserable. <laughs> <laughs> we need somebody to blow some smoke in our face. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> How can you reach the lost if you're not willing to reach them? It starts with you. See, I, 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 can't even, I, I can't even understand why 25 to 30 percent of churches of the Assemblies of God didn't report a convert last year. I want to say, where is the pastor at? Could the pastor not reach one person for God in a year? You know why? Because the pastor, pastor spends no time with sinners. What was Jesus accused of doing? Spending too much time with who? Sinners. Not the problem of the average AB, AG pastor. Jesus spent time with publicans and sinners, and he was criticized for it. Hallelujah. And so you've got to say no to some things. You've got to get some structure in your life. I, uh, I, um, Work with out of our headquarters office, of Springfield, with uh, Mike there, and, and they, you know, they keep moving the office around and, and hopes that when I show up, I won't be able to find it. <laughs> so I showed up a few weeks ago, and there's a little cubby hole for me over in the corner. Yeah. Good thing I'm not insecure. I would think I had no value, but you know, we know better. Than that, so I live in North Carolina. Okay, that's where I live. I live in North Carolina, and we won't. Be Go into all the reasons why that uh, I'm not in Springfield. But uh, I already got that T-shirt. So, but, but I, I, we, we, I uh, we have an assistant in the office in Springfield. Handles my travel, handles my schedule, where I'm going, what I'm doing, all that stuff. But I rent office space in North Carolina where I live. You know why? Because I need the discipline of that. Because when I'm at home in North Carolina, I get up and go to work. I know if I didn't have an office to go to and have, any, have structure in my life there, then it would get sloppy. See, I, I, know, I, I know me. I need structure. And I got some suspicions about you. <laughs> you need structure. The best thing in the world would be your church people to know that you actually have office hours, that you actually go to work. Your kids need to see you go to work. Your spouse needs to see you go to work. Go to work. <laughs> yeah. 
In the mouth of two witnesses, brother, it's being established. Because, because you see, your church people, your church people, your, the level of respect for you will rise when it, it appears like you've got some organization to your ministry and your life and your time. I'm telling you, and, and, and I don't mean this wrong when I say this, but some of you will understand what I mean by this. That's why, that's why a lot of people still refer to you as a preacher instead of a pastor. Preachers are just people who show up and do, do their thing on Sundays. He's my preacher. See, that's not a compliment to me. He's my preacher. Because I, sh I should want to be a lot more than that. But we've created a mentality that makes us just preachers because we have no organization or structure that they can see that we go to work. See, so he's gotten really quiet. It's like that seniors group in Myrtle Beach that I spoke for a couple years ago. They won't have me back there. Because uh, <laughs> I said to the group of seniors there, I'm so tired of hearing senior adults in churches saying, well, you know, I put in my time in that church. I did my nursery duty. It's time for some other people to come step up to the plate in that church. I'm done. I'm retired. And I said to that group of seniors, I said, you know what? You can retire from whatever company you work for. You can retire from doing dishes. You can retire from cooking, as the case is at our home. <laughs> at our house, we have a kitchen for resale purposes. <laughs> She's heard me say this, so don't get out. <laughs> and she's in agreement, unfortunately. But you can never retire from the work of God. As long as you're still breathing, honey, there's something to do for Jesus. Did you know shut-ins in my church had a ministry? I had a ministry. The shut-ins in my church addressed all of the cards that I sent out every week for people's anniversaries and birthdays. My shut-ins at the envelopes. Every Monday morning, I got a, got a stack of cards to sign and write notes on. Because every Monday morning, the first order of business Monday morning was writing notes to people in my church. I took an hour every Monday and wrote notes to people in my church. Dear Bill, I noticed you were ushering yesterday. I just want you to know how important that ministry is to our church. Thanks for what you're doing, Pastor. Dear Sue, I noticed you were in the nursery yesterday during the second service. I just want you to know that a young couple whose baby you were taking care of at that second service came to Jesus yesterday. I just want you to know what an incredible difference you made yesterday in the lives of the life of the family. Thanks for what you're doing, Pastor. I wrote 10 to 15 notes every Monday morning like that to people in my church. How many think that matters? Amen. You know how important it was? I would go to people's homes and see my notes framed on the wall. A note from their pastor. You got time for this? Yeah, come on. Everybody in my church got a birthday card from me, signed by me, not rubber stamped. They got a birthday card when the church was 200. They got a birthday card personally signed by me when the church was 3,000. Because all my shut-ins addressed my envelopes. And I wrote personal notes. And I, almost every Sunday, a mother would walk up to me at the end of a service with a little preschooler. And she just got out of the nursery and say, now, now Sarah, what do you want to say to the pastor? And little Sarah would say, Pastor, thank you for my birthday card. And Mama would say, you know, Pastor, other than our immediate family, your card is the only one she got this year. Does anybody think this matters?
You respond in terms of the best interest of the person who asks you to do something for them. Let's fill this in quickly. We defer creatively and comes up with alternatives so that we don't have to make people mad to fulfill our priorities. So making the most of our time, make to-do lists. All of this is in your notes. I'm not going to get into it with you. Uh, it's all wonderful there. Set your priorities, and we talked about that earlier. Avoid perfectionism. I have a perfectionist nature, and it's your best friend, your worst enemy. I have I have I have people who who you know uh, they get so pastors who get so focused on one little thing in their in their week that they miss the big picture, and that's what perfectionism will do for you. Question everything you're doing, evaluate everything you're doing. Welcome tension in your life. Because what it does, it keeps you focused and keeps you sharp. The only people without tension are people at the cemetery. Everybody else has tension. Avoid clutter. When I walk into some pastor's offices, oh Jesus, let's move on. Avoid procrastination. You know, you're going to do it, you plan to do it, someday you're going to make it happen, but until it gets on your calendar and on your schedule, it will never take place. Control interruptions and distractions. You know, people would call, I just got to talk to the pastor, got to talk to the pastor. Well, he's in prayer and study. Is it an emergency? No, I'll just put but they get mad. Yeah. But understand this. The same person who got upset because you wouldn't talk to them whenever they wanted to talk to you because you were in prayer and study are the same ones that are going to be ticked off when you have nothing to say on Sunday. <laughs> so your job is to decide the priority, not them. Yeah, that's right. Staff your weaknesses. Get people around you who have strengths you don't have. None of us have it all together. All of us have flat sides to our lives. Mike has gifts I don't have. I have gifts Mike doesn't have. We, but that's, that's the power of a team. And one of the things we're, we're pastors and, and leaders are telling us all over the country right now as we get them working together with their, with their lay leadership in a, in a team effort, they're learning how powerful it is to be a part of a team where everybody's gifts are brought to the table and we're able to leverage all those gifts. I have lay people all the time telling me, I wish my pastor would let me help him. But the pastor's too insecure because he's got to pretend like he has all the gifts. Stop it. Everybody has flat sides to their lives. Everybody does. John Maxwell, who I worked with for a number of years, this man loses his car keys every week. <laughs> Great leader. He can't keep up with his car keys. Don't the truth. All of us have flat sides to our lives. Staff your weaknesses, get people around you. Listen to your spouse. I mean, I can't believe you didn't, ladies, you didn't get that moment to say amen or something. You've got to be alert for these moments. I mean, you know, use a calendar to, in your life. Here are the three questions you must ask yourself as a leader, and I'm done. Number one, what is required of me? What must I do that nobody else in my church can do? What's required of me? And let me just say this. That list is shorter than you think. That list is shorter than you think. <clears throat> well, here's, what's, here's, what, here's what, what every pastor has to do. You are the primary preacher teacher of your church. I didn't say you did it all, but you're the primary communicator, preacher teacher in your church. If you're, the, if you're the lead pastor. Secondly, you have to pastor the leadership of your church. You see, as a church grows, you never stop pastoring. It's who you pastor that makes it matters. 
See, I pastored my leadership when my church got larger. I pastored the leaders, and the leaders pastored the people. I never stopped going to the hospitals, but I went to the hospital for my leaders. And so you, what is required of me? I'm the primary preacher teacher. I have to, I have to, I have to uh, pastor the leadership of my church, train, equip, and develop leadership. And I'm the primary vision caster. Everything else beyond that can be delegated to other people. Now here's the here's the deal. While you're while you're taking out the garbage and while you're mowing the grass and while you're doing all this other stuff, you know what? Nobody's doing your job. Nobody's preparing to preach on Sunday while you're cutting the grass at the church. You see, if, if you keep doing everybody else's job, nobody's going to be doing yours. Yeah, that's right. What's required of me? Secondly, what gives me the greatest return? What must I do that will bring the, the greatest results for the church and ministry? Thirdly, what gives me the greatest reward? What do I do that keeps me motivated? Surely in a week's time, there's something that you do that you enjoy that turns your crank. Maybe it's administration. Maybe, maybe it is counseling people. Maybe it is preaching. Here's what I know. If it wasn't for Sunday, I couldn't put up with all that stuff all week. Sunday was a reward for me. You know why? Because preaching the word is what kept me motivated. So in, if you look at a week of ministry and there's nothing that you look forward to doing in that week, we got a problem. If you can't find anything that keeps you motivated, keeps you encouraged, keeps you excited, then um, I need to question whether or not you're in the ministry, you should be in the ministry. There's got to be something that keeps you going. Maybe, as one guy told me, doing the church bulletin just really motivated him. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> said, all right, brother. God bless you. Three questions. What is required of me? What gives the greatest return? And thirdly, what gives me the greatest reward? In other words, what motivates me, what keeps me going, what keeps me doing this every week? Your destiny is determined by what you do daily. Your future is in how you spend your time. Get some organization. Thank you very much. God bless.